Hi, welcome to this week's seminar on flamenco. Today I'll be talking about the, the readings that you've been going over in the last few weeks to do with the origins and the formation of flamenco. I'll also talk about the, the readings on regions of flamenco and also about the forms that we use to, to play the different styles of flamenco. So starting off with um, Tom Evans and William Washburg, their research really covered the history and the formation of, of flamenco. Washburg had a bit of a funny view of um, calling irony a, a part of the, the parody of how flamenco was formed out of how it became a popular culture for the middle class to be interested in street life and uh, lower art forms, as they would have described. But um, the way that flamencos saw this was um, that at that time they were mostly singers, it was on the streets, it was part of their work that was mostly um, done as blacksmiths or in the, the land. So we have a, a culture of um, underprivileged and outcast community that, that had this wonderful expression in their their community and their culture that was formed over a long period of time. And then suddenly it's become viewed upon as a somewhat popular idea to put it on the stage. So this formation of the staging of flamenco really took place from roughly the 1860s and ended up by the 80s, the 1880s, that is, that um, this really popular club or cafe style of performance had emerged called uh, Cafe Cantante. This was really, really big in places like Seville and Madrid, Barcelona, and um, and also more provincial towns like um, Jerez de Frontera and Arcos and many other places in Andalusia. So um, where Washerberg is um, really, I guess what he's doing really well in his uh, uh, responses to his research is to talk about the key historical landmarks of the 19th and 20th century. So he talks about this era, the Cafe Cantante era, and how it become, became so popular among the middle class. The, um, the next area that he talked about was the emergence of a, um, something called opera flamenco. It's not really opera. It's, it was basically a tax exemption to call it opera. But it was, uh, unfortunately, it became more of a diluted and over-marketed sort of form of flamenco presentation. Uh, the next element in this, this narrative, I suppose, of the history was to bring back what had been essentially lost in um, the, pr the performance of this art. And by putting a competition together in 1922, uh, the organizers, uh, composer Manuel de Falla, and the great poet Federico Garcia Lorca, they put this, this concept together to, to invite uh, non-professional singers. That kind of backfired, but we'll talk about that later. But um, they invited uh, non-professional singers to sing their more heavy, uh, somewhat traditional or older style of singing, which we call uh, cante hondo, which is a deep song. It's also related to cante gitano, which is uh, gypsy singing. So the singer of that competition was actually an ex-professional singer, so it kind of backfired on them, thinking they could win a competition with amateur performers. But anyway, I think that proved that part of flamenco performance is a professional art. And um, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful, beautiful art form. So let's, let's talk more about that. Um, of I guess the, some of the, the, the notions that come out of this research is um, on purity. As soon as you, um, you have a golden era, which is what we call the, um, the Cafe Cantante era, people want to retain elements of that, that purity and that state. So I guess if you're going to talk about purity, and this is actually quite a, a discourse among academics and can provide a lot of arguments for people, so I don't mean any disrespect to anyone in this topic, but um, if I might shed some light on what people have talked about with purity in the last 100 years, 
with, uh, with literature and maybe talk about how what we look at uh, purity today in flamenco, which is more to do with the music. So pre-Café Cantante, when Cante, I'm talking about singing when I say the word Cante, sorry. Um, it was from the people, it was from the streets, it was a more of a, a holistic, more of an organic sort of place. In that, in that position, I guess you could say it's pure. It comes from a list of songs and song formats that were generally performed by gypsies and people that uh, shared the same temperament in their music. When it became a stage art, the people that came were the middle class and part of their, their interest in uh, street music essentially was um, how we could associate Andalusian music with, with this type of gypsy music. So there was a, a hybrid and mixing of um, new elements to flamenco really early on. So through the Café Cantante era, we have a split in the type of singing. We have singing for gypsies, which are the really heavy Cante Hondo style, and singing for Andalusians. So we call this Cante Andaluz. So the, the newer, more popular forms, Cante Andaluz, include styles like Fandango, Malagaña, and they, they draw uh, a lot of favoritism in the audiences that were performing this. Okay, so already we've lost some of the so-called purity in bringing in Cante Andaluz. So what happened after Café Cantante was, like I said earlier, just a complete dilution of the style. It was more of a staged, popular sort of format of it. So what was done in the in 22 by uh, Fire was to really bring it back to this Cante Hondo state, okay? So when people talk about purity in flamenco at this point, they're talking about re returning Cante Gitano into more of a, um, a, a gypsy-owned art form, okay? So a lot of people would say that flamenco is best looked after by gypsies. But over the next you know, generations, the decades that followed, uh, really, it, it was really clear that the flamenco performers were both gypsies and non-gypsies. So it became more of a, a, a search for who could, who could represent the art form in the best way. So today, some of our greatest artists of all time have not been gypsies at all, like um, the guitarist Paco Lathia, and of the Café Cantante era himself, um, Antonio Chacon, a great singer, who was not a gypsy, but is regarded as one of the greatest singers of all time for flamenco. So I guess to, to lay the topic of purity to rest is that if you want to feel a sense of purity in flamenco today, it's about how well you play in time, how well you respect the rhythm and know what the singer's going to do so you can respond to them as well. Okay, so there were some great readings alongside their, um, their research that came about through, um, they, they cited many great authors like Felix Grand and um, Molina and Mairena, Crucis Roland, a lot of uh, academics that are still uh, working today as well. So the regions of flamenco, Matthew talked about uh, regional aspects and impacts of flamenco. So we, we're going to move on to that. The um, flamenco regions, it comes from Andalusia, but it was also from the Café Cantante era, put on the stage in Madrid. And Madrid is the capital. It's got this a real sense of, um, you go to the capital to, to have a career. So a lot of flamenco artists came from Andalusia to Madrid, to Barcelona, to back to the south, in a, in a circuit of performance spaces that um, we, we call the Flamenco Triangle that we have. And this is uh, an example on the screen. We have um, the one between Cadiz, Sevilla, and Ronda. And that extends to Cordoba and Granada in other ways. But um, so you can see different arguments for different elements of where the flamenco uh, sort of lived. Right, so it does appear that it is a regional form, especially when you look at uh, the singing of Andalusian songs. So there are a lot of cantes 
that come from Granada. So we call these cantes de Granada. And same with Jerez, with Bolarias. There's a lot of forms that I could talk about in Spanish that don't make a lot of sense to you in English, but uh, uh, there is quite a lot of regionalism which impacts how we how we associate flamenco song, and it's it's a beautiful way to celebrate the regions and each of these different styles of songs. Okay, so on to um, uh, the reading of the guitar forms by Peter Manuel. Now this was written in 1980, so there's been quite a lot happened <laughs> since then. In fact, his manual doesn't actually list any other, um, well, doesn't really cite many other methods of guitar. The first method of guitar that was written in 1902 was published. Raphael Marin uh, wrote that one. But um, early on, it was really clear as to how to present flamenco music. There was a clear indication of notation and tablature. Now, what's differed over the last 100 years is how people put it down on paper. Obviously, there are so many different people that come to it from different backgrounds, people from educated university study backgrounds to people that just learn it from the street, you could say. So we have all these different ways of writing down flamenco, which is very confusing and complex. So a way that I could try to um, kind of go through Peter's uh, research is to sort of format his transcription a little better. So you can see that I've got an example here of his solea. Um, essentially, this type of rhythm, it's part of the, the gypsy song. So this is more of the, the older flamenco. So this is uh, solea. And it's got 12 beats. Okay, so the 12 beats represent, um, in my view, they represent crotchets. So it could be represented as 12-4. Uh, reading 12-4 is very difficult. So I subdivided into bars of 3-4, which is very common. However, where we put the downbeat is uh, something that's uh, very, uh, causes a bit of discourse among uh, theorists, but anyway. Um, Peter's put down beat one as the downbeat. Unfortunately, in Soleil, beat 12 is the downbeat. So beat 12 is, is home. So I might just talk about the, the accents. So we've got, um, I'll just tap them out. Maybe if I can do it this way. So um, we've got, I'll just clap it for you. Here we go. So you've got 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10. Okay. Okay, so likewise with the Solia, his other example for Sigurdias, it has the same kind of hemiola aspect, but we start on beat eight. So it carries over the same kind of accents, and there's two ways of counting this one. So uh, I thought it would be necessary to talk about these particular palos because he really tried to represent them in counting different versions of it, but this is actually how we talk about it in dance rehearsals and performance spaces. So here we go. This is for Sigurdias. So we've got um, two ways of counting. You've got one and two and three and uh, four and uh, five. We also have the other one underneath that, which is eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then that repeats around. So the downbeat for Sigurdias is beat eight, you could consider it that way. Okay, so the forms and bylaws, we can divide into a couple of different groupings. We've talked about um, gypsy songs, cante gitano, and Andalusian songs, so cante andaluz. So a lot of these are called the fandango family. And I might play through a couple of tonalities that you could associate with fandango. So we have this sort of sound. <laughs> That's a typical fandango rhythm. But what was really great about the evolution, I suppose, the progress of fandango is that we put it into different flamenco keys. So by moving this, very Phrygian tonality, we move that up the neck. So we have that. 
same voicing here, but with different open notes to create a different sort of sonority. So that one's called Taranta. We move that up again to G sharp Phrygian, which is, I guess it's in the key of E. Which is really a really lovely tonality. We're going from A. Same thing with the middle key, so por medio. We used similar sort of movements, so seguidillas, we could have uh, A, Same thing happens. We move that up and down into um, what we call a grainia key. So I'm just sort of speeding through a couple of these, but um, same thing, moving it up. Often, what we're looking for with these tonalities for the guitar is to include an open string that will have an, an, an air of this kind of tension. For instance, um, you can have that, that flat nine. Yeah. Okay. So the next one along in the, the family of different groupings of songs or palos, we have uh, songs from either de Vuelta, which is the last one we're going to talk about, we have um, uh, songs that are really, I guess, associated with Cuba and and Mexico, and a lot of a lot of colonialized songs that were brought back to Spain. So that either they're well, those the return of music back from Latin America back to Spain. So we have a lot of things like rumba, which is a lot of fun. You see a lot of it uh, quite popular with the Gypsy Kings and bands like uh, Ojos de Brujo, and uh, it's a lot of fun to to get into that. The last uh, couple of figures I've got go through just a basic um, template of rhythm, which we call compas. So that 12 beat pattern that I started with before for uh, Solea, I've drawn that here. So you can see what the, the palmeros, the clappers, what, the, what we're doing uh, underneath the music, okay? So something that goes along with this uh, concept of rhythm is the, I guess the textural qualities of what what happens with the singer with the guitar and with the dance so I've got a couple of words written down here for you to, to take on board that um, deal with um, the form of say a solea where we might have an introduction a verse and an ending so each verse as you can see on the format here everything is followed by an ending and, and an ending is called a remate so a remate, let's say, so for, so, say for sol, yeah. we have an introduction. Falsetta, we just look at the same thing just as a, a guitar interlude. So we have A, A, Do, one. Just a couple of light sort of touches with that. 
and then into the dance sort of structure. Uh, a yamala is something that a dancer does at the, it's a, a call, the singer finishes the verse calling to the dancer and the dancer will come in with their yamala which is this very visceral, immediate sort of approach to uh, the structure of the music, it lifts it up and again that finishes with a, a remate. So a typical sort of uh, yamala, it's pretty pretty big, so we have um, out of the verse. <laughs> longer of course depending on the dancer they he or she might want to really extend that um, same thing goes to the next two topics we've got um, Escobilla which is I guess a theme and variation for the dancer it's where the music stops and the dancer then gets to express more I guess through playing a slower form and speeding it up so there's a typical melody that goes through that there's um <laughs> Otherwise, you can strum that. Same sort of thing we could use for Escobilla. And now, the last thing is a subida, which is a speed up. And you can just imagine just the crazy elevation of technique that dancers and musicians have to, uh, to continue that. So, I'm just going to stop there with, um, I guess, outlining some of these with the dancer. But you can see there's quite a lot involved with the intercommunication between uh, musicians and dancers and there's a lot of instinct that goes alongside knowing the flow of what, what happens. So it's about being able to be responsible as a performer for your role and respecting and understanding deeply what other people are doing. So for performances, you could, re I guess as a guitarist, I've spent a lot of years with dancers learning their steps and what they want to express, which changes a lot in each performance, but some things still re retain. So what they will need is a falsetta from me, a melody or two that they can choreograph their steps to. And for me, what I'll often need is just their, their escobilla or their yamada, versions of their different yamadas, which are those very rhythmic percussive breaks. Um, so those are very rehearsed versions. Other versions, you could just meet someone at a, at a performance and just go for it. So there's a lot of ease with the structure the more you do it, okay? So, um, yeah, I hope you've found this helpful with your, your learning this week with uh, Flamenco. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with myself or Ken or Michael. And, um, yeah, thanks very much. <laughs>